And now, Fairfax Breakfast Club with your host, Basil Lemba. Welcome to the Fairfax Breakfast Club show. My name is Basil Lemba and I will be your host. The Fairfax Breakfast Club is a weekly program in which we bring to you valuable and workable know-how you can use to improve your skills in networking and grow your business. We always start the show with a quote. Today's quote is from Dela Lama. Here it is. I became the Dela Lama not on a volunteer basis. With us today in the studio, we have a very special guest, someone who works for a non-profit organization, which is unusual. Generally, we have for profit organization. <laughs> Though we had just a non-profit now a minute ago. Her name is Serena Amin, and I would like to let her introduce herself and her organization. Hello, Serena. Hello, Basil. How are you? Good, how about you? Doing well, thank you. Very good. So tell these fine people what you do and what your organization does. Sure. Well, the Barker Foundation is a nonprofit adoption agency mm -hmm. located in Bethesda, mm -hmm. but we are also licensed in uh, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. Mm -hmm. We provide all types of adoption services, including birth parent counseling, domestic infant adoptions, mm -hmm. international adoptions, mm -hmm. and the program I work specifically with, with, which is the Older Child Adoption Program. Okay. Now, you mentioned to me something when we talk about the phone, the older child adoptions. You mentioned that people may not be aware of it, its existence, what it does, and what have you. Can you be uh, discuss that for a minute? Sure. Well, if we look at some of the statistics about um, United States foster care currently, mm -hmm. there are over 400,000 children awaiting foster oh, that really? are currently in foster care. And over 120,000 of those children are currently awaiting adoption. That's a very, very large amount of children who are waiting for adoption. Okay, let me ask you, let me, let me stop there. Why do we have them in a waiting for adoption? What is the problem? How do they wind up there? Parents died or what? How did that happen? Because we're not treated well in the family? Where are they coming from? Well, that's a great question. Um, most of the kids come into foster care due to some type of um, abuse or neglect situation. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes that could be physical abuse, emotional abuse, mm -hmm. sexual abuse, mm -hmm. or just instances of neglect. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a lot of times there's misconceptions about the kids who are in foster care that they may be juvenile delinquents and things like that. But most of the time, these kids are ending up in care due to no fault of their own. Gotcha. Okay. So then there are those, and then how, what, how your program works? How, how, how do you come to help them? Well, what our program so specifically does is we contract with public agencies such as Fairfax County Department of Social Services, mm -hmm. and we work with them to find and recruit families for uh, adoption, mm -hmm. and then we will work with the public agencies to find kids who are currently in the foster care system mm -hmm. through a specific matching process. Mm -hmm. So on our side, we're working with the families, and then we search for the kids in foster care to find the best possible match for that child and that family. Mm -hmm. and we we really focus on child-centered practices to advocate for what's best for the child. So at the end of the day, we really want to find the best family and the best fit that we can find to make that a successful family. Hmm. Should we say that you are like um, a recruiter and HR, not as the same thing? Well, I mean, not the same thing of previously because emotion and other things come in play when it comes to matching. Because not just, what I'm trying to say, not just a matter of grabbing a child and putting him somewhere, but it's a matter of taking a look at the child, seeing exactly who it is, and seeing if he can fit in the family trying, interested in taking him on. Is that, is that what it is? Yes. I mean, on one side, we're recruiting for families who are open and willing to parent a child who may have been through some significant challenges in their life. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we're looking for children who are ready and able to be in a family situation. And we want to work with both sides so we can ensure that this is a great match for the families and that the services that we can put in place after the adoption has occurred mm -hmm. will help this family grow into a successful, well-balanced family. Mm -hmm. Now, you say something in a minute. You say a child who is ready to go into family situation. Does that mean there are some children that are not ready to go into family situation then? Well, for a child, being in foster care can be a very tough situation. First of all, you've dealt with 
you know, losing the, your biological family, mm -hmm. you're put into lots of temporary situations, you may be bounced back and forth between different foster homes, um, you may have changed schools several times, you may have experienced things in life that children just shouldn't be exposed to. Mm -hmm. So those children are coming to our program with several types of challenges. Sometimes we can see behavioral challenges, emotional challenges, educational challenges. So we try to prepare our families in the front hand to understand what these things mean and how they can help that child move past the trauma that they've suffered in their life mm -hmm. and thrive successfully in a, in a family situation. Because a lot of these children haven't been used to pa being parented. Some of them have mostly parented themselves. Mm -hmm. So being in a family is very different than what these children are used to. Mm -hmm. How do the equation going to work? Is that, you know, we have, so this guy who had never been parented, now in the same situation that's being parented. I guess education is a factor, I guess on both sides? On both sides. Where, where do you have these kids? You, so you have them, you have them living in a, in a how do you call that, in a kind of like an orphan or whatever, or are they, where are they, the, the kids that you're taking care of, where are they generally? It depends. We can search for children all over the country. Oh, you can? Okay. And there are s several situations. Um, there, the child could be in a group home, mm -hmm. which is a therapeutic environment mm -hmm. um, for children who are not currently in a foster environment. Mm -hmm. And then there's foster homes where um, a family will sign up through their local county to be foster parents. Gotcha. And sometimes that family could be an adoptive resource, but oftentimes foster families are not adoptive resources. They have a choice on whether they want to adopt that child or not. Okay. So if the family is not an adoptive resource, then the social worker on the state side is going to be looking for permanency for that child. While it's being with the foster family? Yes. Okay. So while they're being parented temporarily in the foster situation. Mm -hmm. The social workers are actively recruiting for families. Now, if generally, if they can't find a family within their own county, they will reach out to organizations like ours who can work with them in finding families which may be out of state or, you know, out of their location. But that's okay because we have different state contracts where we can um, easily receive kids from other states and place them in our, in the families within Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. Okay. Now, I want to talk about philanthropy and volunteering a little bit, which is why the quote was there. <laughs> I picked that quote because I found it very strong, uh, in a way. Uh, but before I go into that, I have a question. What motivated you to work for the Barker Foundation? Well, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, when I started off in my undergrad degree at George Mason University, mm -hmm. I did international studies, and I, um, went on a study abroad program to Morocco. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. we had a, um, we worked at an, or, uh, an orphanage there, mm -hmm. uh, and we spent some time kind of learning about this organization and seeing the kids there. And it really opened my eyes to the field of adoption. Mm -hmm. So when I came back home, I kept thinking about this orphanage where I'd seen kids just sitting in really large play pens and there was maybe 30 toddlers just, you know, and we, we couldn't pick them up, we couldn't hold them, we couldn't cuddle with them because you had 30 of these children that needed and wanted attention. And you have to cuddle 30 people. Up. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So um, when I came back, I, you know, it was something that just lasted on my mind. Mm -hmm. And I started working at uh, a law firm in D.C. where I met an adoption attorney. Mm -hmm. And um, he connected me with the Barker Foundation as a volunteer experience. Mm -hmm. So I decided to move forward and do my master's in social work, and I ended up doing my internship at the Barker Foundation, where I worked for the Older Child Adoption Program. Mm -hmm. And once I graduated, they had a position available for me, and I've been there ever since. Mm -hmm. So basically, you are a volunteer at heart. I am. I am. Okay. And I think a lot of people who end up doing work like this um, have to have some kind of connection mm -hmm. and, and some reason why adoption or foster care is so important to them. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's also a great field, and at the end of the day, you go home and you can feel happy about what you're doing, and that was very important for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I work in a nonprofit organization for 10 years, mm -hmm. personally, and um, I came to the nonprofit arena. And one, one of the things that struck me 
in a non-profit organization, at the end of the day, we say, my God, we need more time. We got to stay. We need, we need more time. We, we, want, we need to do this. We, we can't go home right now. That's the feeling that I saw. And it was so a contrast with the for-profit organization. And what, about, look, what time is it? Is it time yet? We got to go. Is it time yet? <laughs> and to me, like, to, having worked there for 10 years, and then wound up in it was just striking. It, it, to me, it brings back uh, this remarkable philosopher, Hubbard, who said, the first motivation of an individual is duty. That's what the Dalai Lama quote, he said, I become a volunteer, I become a Dalai Lama, not on volunteering basis, but because he felt he has to. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? And that is the highest motivation. And uh, I want to take that up because there is a sense in the culture, yeah, I got to make money, I got to, everybody's like running after money. But deep down, it's, yes, money is important. Yes, you got to pay the bill. But that would not drive a human being as much as the sheer willingness to do, to help people, or because the sense of duty to get something done. Yes. Very much so. To me, that's very exciting. And I believe that we have the for-profit organization which we need to have, but the non-profit has really won keeping this thing going. Yeah. And, and one thing I've tried to do a lot on my side um, as the outreach coordinator for the program is to connect with a lot of for-profit businesses mm -hmm. because they can really be useful with just and helping to spread the word of older child adoption. Mm -hmm. If a for-profit company puts up a flyer at their store, or if the you know the owner of the for-profit company is an advocate for adoption practices, just word of mouth ends up really helping and finding families for these kids who are just waiting for mm -hmm. some permanency in their life. Mm -hmm. And it's so you're right. It's so fun. We need both worlds. I'll say that. We um, do. But. To me, the world sits on non-profit organization. I mean, example is the government. Mm -hmm. You know, I was at seminaries. In fact, I was talking to Gerald Gordon, the, the, the CEO of uh, Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. Uh, there was a congressman there speaking. You know, I, when the congressman came, he to try to turn off his from the government. Let's not listen. <laughs> <laughs> but the guy made a point, which you know, it's, it's so fashionable. Say the government does not do anything. But he gave some example. What at the internet? Mind you, was funded by the government. And look at the impact that it has worldwide. Oh, yeah. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking about that, you, you start looking at those non-profit labs, huh? Eh, 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 because you go to a networking event. And I want to address that over here because this will be seen by several business people. There's a tendency when somebody says, well, I'm from a non-profit organization, people are like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the internet drop, drop down. Uh, pretty much, I mean, I, I'm not telling that they are wrong, what have you, but there is not a, and it may be because also the non-profit organization did not present or promote themselves well and promote like a government, government not come and say and do the, yes, you know what, you can say everything bad about us, what well, we did, we did, we did, which they did do. The guy listed three major programs that the government have funded that impacted life in so many ways. The government should be saying that to people. Yes, they are not perfect, that's understandable, but it's so fundamental. Mm -hmm. We have a lady here, she opened a free clinic in Loudoun, in Fairfax. And she went around and started grabbing people, yeah, give them some money, say, I need a place to do this, I need to go to do this, da 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 da. Yeah, oh doctor, we need one hour from you, da da da. And people are, hey, why are you doing all this? And then she told them, we have those people who do not have access to insurance. Mm -hmm. If one of them, get contaminated with the disease will spread through the whole county. Exactly. People say, oh my God, yeah, where well, should you write? You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by it all sits literally on non-profit organization. It does. Pull out the non-profit organization, the whole thing collapses. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to see that happen. No, 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 no. I'm, just, I'm trying to drive home a point. Yes, of course. The value, the importance of non-profit organization. And by that also I'm saying support them whenever you meet them. You I may agree. not understand what they're doing, but I can guarantee you that there is a reason and they are playing a major role they are. in everything that we're doing. Yeah. That's what I want to invite you so you can come and share that. When you mentioned to me, because it, it, same here, I never thought, I thought about adoption with a little kid, yeah, got to be adopted, yes, that makes sense. But I never thought about that with a section mm -hmm. of the grown-up who, who still can use some assistance. 
for example. So what project you guys are working on right now? Or give us some example of uh, some of the work that you guys have done. Sure. Um, one, of the, one of the adoptions that I saw last year that we helped to facilitate was an adoption of a 17-year-old girl from Texas. Right. And um, I think when, sometimes when I mention the age ranges of children that we're working to place, which is generally between 10 and 17, mm -hmm. I think people get really scared of that age. And they say, oh, you know, teenagers, they're going to come in with the house and, you know, the boys and girls and, you know, just, just being disrespectful. They've had so much personality already. But if you think about what the impact makes for adopting a 17-year-old who otherwise would have probably gone off, probably not have considered college, may have ended up on public assistance, may have ended up incarcerated, may have ended up homeless. Mm -hmm. You have taken the 17-year-old child and now this family we can, can guide her and help her develop into a healthy and productive adult. Mm -hmm. I look back on my life and I think at 17, I wasn't ready to be in the world on my own. Mm -hmm. Even at 18 or 19 and 20, I still wasn't ready to completely be out there on my own. Mm -hmm. But my family con consistently provided that guidance and support for me. Mm -hmm. And when you think about some of these kids who are aging out of foster care, mm -hmm. they, don't ha they don't have anybody to go home to on Thanksgiving. They don't have anybody to go home to on Christmas mm -hmm. or whatever holiday that they celebrate. They are really left out there in the world. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are wonderful agencies that are trying to promote services that will help transition these teens mm -hmm. into a productive life. But I think the need for permanency in these children's lives are, is so much more stability, important. Stability, you mean? Yes. Permanency and stability mm -hmm. can really change a child's life. Mm -hmm. I recently did an interview um, for the blog that I work on for the Barker Foundation, mm -hmm. and I interviewed one of our teens who, she is the first teen that's been adopted through our program who's gone off to college. and. She just said some really powerful things to me. And when I heard her story and how she, prior to being adopted, she never thought college was an option for her. Mm -hmm. She was always worrying about taking care of her younger siblings mm -hmm. and you know, making sure everybody was OK. Mm -hmm. And once her and her siblings were adopted with a family that worked with our program, mm -hmm. she thrived. I mean, not saying that she didn't have her challenges, but this went from a young lady who never thought she'd be in college, and now she's studying psychology. Mm -hmm at a four-year university. And I think stories like that are just what really opens my eyes to this field and, and how much these children need a family to help them with those circumstances. Very good. Well, a uh, very, very remarkable philosopher say, save the child and you save the nation. Well, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> there are some um, very very striking statistics mm -hmm. about children who are aging out of the foster care system and how they contribute to the amount of homelessness, incarceration rates, public assistance rates. Do you know, do you know the numbers? Um, I, not off the top of my head, okay. but it's, it's a large amount. I imagine. Well, it's like anything, you know, it's like no different, no different. So there's a difference, but it's like a plant. If you take a plant, just sit out there, nothing happens. But if you take it and then put water on it, put whatever needs in it, and take care of it, it's going to blossom. Exactly. My, my family was from Africa, so I live in Paris. So I go in high school there. You know, I didn't have any challenge. But I remember when I was 18, she said, I got to be home at 8 o'clock. I'm like, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Talking about a clash of magnitude. Because not that I wanted to challenge her, because 8 o'clock is the time where the party starts. <laughs> <laughs> You get what I'm saying? And she, uh, if I come after her, I find that the door's locked. I mean, of course, it was a kind of like a, uh, it was not, it was just, it was one intention going against another intention. She wanted me to be home because I was, if I say I want to be out, because that's where the party starts. But then some years back, I went back to Paris, and I was taking, a, I was in a train, and just, I was, I don't know, maybe I was there for a mission. And then I see a guy, and who was playing guitar in the train you know, with a, a hat. I was just playing, it was like, you know, like a bum really, playing guitar and then people giving money. That is one of the guys I went to school with. And these are the people who never had a problem to stay after 8 o'clock. 
Yeah. You understand? So when you backtrack, that's what I'm talking about, taking care, educating. She knew what she was. Oh, by the way, today, my aunt and I have a relationship that I would never have dreamed of. I mean, I look at her and say, my God, we have this relationship? How is that possible? <laughs> but you see, at that point, somebody was guiding me, say, you do this, you do this, you do that. But I didn't want to do it then. And Lord only can tell what could have happened. And I see a guy who I was going out with at the same time to those Paris, and he's sitting in Paris now playing guitar and making a living out of it. I look at him and say, wow. Yeah, and I think on, I, I mentioned, I heard one of the things that you mentioned was that education and mm -hmm. guidance was a large part. And I think for our program, we also try and do a great job at guiding and educating our families mm -hmm. who work through our program because this is very different. And not all of the families who come to our program have had experience mm -hmm. being a parent. Mm -hmm. Some gotcha. might have a child in the home, some may not mm -hmm. have a child in the home. So um, we do a training called Pride Training. Pride Training? Pride Training. Okay. And basically this is an older child adopt adoption training, which mm -hmm. we offer at our organization, but you can also take it through your local county. Um, and it teaches you about the various challenges that you can see in foster care. So mm -hmm. it'll talk about attachment challenges, um, grief and loss, transracial and transcultural adoption, mm -hmm. um, just various various topics that you see that are very common in foster care adoption. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a great opportunity for families to learn more. Mm -hmm. Even if you, they might think, okay, this might not be for me. Mm -hmm. They can come in and, and learn about the program through this training. Mm -hmm. And it really opens, I think, their eyes, their eyes mm -hmm. to all of the various challenges that you may see. Mm -hmm. And at some point, there might be families who will say, okay, well, this might not be the type of adoption that's for our family, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And then there might be the other families who say, this is exactly what we were looking for. Okay. So again, older child adoption is not for everybody, but mm -hmm. I think if people can get educated about it and have an agency or someone that is knowledgeable about the type of adoption they're interested in. Mm -hmm. It can be very helpful in guiding and making this a smooth process. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, we see the website here. We, we want to put on the screen there so people know I can learn more about your foundation and get that data. And also, I want to segue into the expo coming up. But before we segue into that, I would like to show you a short section over here of uh, our expo coming up on May 17th. Welcome back. Uh, so we'll have you as one of our exhibitors on uh, May 17 Expo. Yes. We'll be right here in Reston. I think that will be a great opportunity and give you a good exposure. We'll have 100 exhibitors there, and we're expecting four to 500 business people. In fact, we're putting on a seminar for all the exhibitors on April 4th. I don't even get that information. I do. Yes, that would be a great opportunity if we want to share, because unlike anything, it has its own know-how exhibiting. Mm -hmm. So we want to give that to them so they know what to do before, during, and after the expo. I think that would be a great opportunity, definitely, for you to get the word out. Absolutely. So we can come up with the tools so you can meet that many more people. Okay? Yeah, and this business is all about relationships and just being able to get the word out about older child adoption. And also because you get to see parents, as you mentioned, some may do adoption, some may not. But I'm pretty sure that some of those can help your organization financially or contribute once they know about it. Absolutely. We're a 501c3, so mm -hmm. we always accept uh, financial donations. You can donate through our website. You don't have to wait for the expo. You can donate right now. Mm -hmm. Just <laughs> you can donate through our website. But also, um, you know, we do have a lot of opportunities for volunteer. Okay. So if families or people are not interested in maybe financially donating, um, mm -hmm. they are more than welcome to come in and help with some of the activities that we have going on. Okay. Very good, excellent. Okay, so now, uh, what else is it? Uh, what other? So you have a foundation over here in DC. It's actually located in Bethesda. In Bethesda, okay, very good. Do you have any other um, satellite office in this area? We do have a satellite office in Falls Church. Okay, very good. Anywhere else, or these are the two you have? Those are the two. Uh, we also, I believe, we have a satellite office in Washington D.C., but it's not an office that we use frequently. Okay. The one in Falls Church uh, houses our international program, mm -hmm. but all of the main meetings and information sessions that we hold are going to be at our Bethesda location. Very good. So, is there any particular type of family parents that you're looking for? 
We are all inclusive. We okay. will accept any family of any race, background, sexual orientation, mm -hmm. religious background. Mm -hmm. um, we want everybody to have an opportunity. There is, um, there is an application process mm -hmm. and the applications are reviewed and there are certain restrictions for each program, mm -hmm. but um, you can learn more about that on our website. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for families just interested in any type of adoption, whether it be infant, international or older child, to at least come and we offer a free information session every month for families to learn more about adoption in general. Well, folks, you hear from her, Serena, uh, the basic of invitation here today is uh, save the child and you save the nation. Uh, when we think of adoption, we do not think of the little ones, but there's also, maybe we should start up, uh, also adoption for the, uh, the adult. Mm -hmm. the some of it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But there's also the elderly, which uh, could use some help because it does make a total, complete difference on uh, the life of anybody. Uh, I just before we close that, I want to mention that we have the breakfast event taking place here in Fairfax. You can find more information on that on our website, which is blnbc.com. We do that twice a, twice a month, I mean, once or twice, the second or third Thursday of the month. Thank you for tuning in. See you next time. Have a good night. Bye-bye.